Bibliophiles of the internet, my name is Adriana and today I'm here to bring you my April wrap up. Not only was April a solid reading month for me, but we did some exciting things, made some very big moves. To give a quick recap, our group Quarantine Pages was featured in Forbes. Yes, the Forbes. I was featured on Penguin Teen's official podcast We Are YA as their first booktube guest and I was a featured panelist for the booktube panel as part of the Social Distance Book Fest. If you missed any of that, you can still access it at your convenience and I will link everything down below. And also we are continuing to make some exciting moves in May, so stay tuned for that. So let's talk about the books. The first book I read in April was Josh and Hazel's Guide to Not Dating by Christina Lauren. This is an adult romance about Hazel, an eccentric, excitable, creative elementary school teacher who reconnects with her former college TA, Josh. Josh is more of a laid back, practical, Korean American medical professional, and the two of them strike up a fast friendship and decide to set up each other on what becomes a series of progressively horrible blind dates. Content warnings for use of a homophobic slur, brief use of transness as a punchline, and instances of bleeding after sex. I have kind of mixed feelings about this one because I was totally on board for like 80% of the story and then the ending came so quickly and invoked one of my absolute least favorite romance tropes. I don't want to yuck anyone's yum as they say, but the ending just really threw me for a loop and went off in a direction I did not expect. That said, up until that point, I think the story is hilarious and really sweet. I love the dynamic between Hazel and Josh because they're so different. Hazel is unapologetically eccentric and vibrant and she is unwilling to compromise those parts of herself just to find romance. And Josh is incredibly thoughtful and sweet and he really comes to appreciate Hazel the way she is because they're friends first. It's also interesting to see how both these characters have internalized so much self-doubt from past relationships and how the process of getting to know each other is really healing for both of them in so many ways. This story made me laugh out loud so much and it's punctuated by hilariously bad dates and steamy one night stands, but like I said, the ending was not to my taste and I also have some thoughts on the exoticization of POC as love interests, but we won't get into that. I still definitely want to read more from Christina Lauren and I gave this one three and a half stars. Then I just had to reread Running With Lions by Julian Winters. I love this book. It's an own voices queer YA contemporary story about Sebastian who has a lot happening going into his senior year with potentially becoming captain of the soccer team and trying to figure out what his post high school plans look like. And things only get more complicated when he and the soccer team begin their annual summer training camp with the sudden appearance of Amir Shah, Sebastian's childhood ex-friend who has a horrible attitude and no experience with the game which could definitely influence the team's success. Content warnings for brief instances of incurred homophobia, exploration of body dysmorphia, and use of homophobic and sexual slurs. This book just hits on everything I want. Queer romance, summer romance, sports romance, second chance friends to enemies to lovers romance. It's all in this book. It's also a celebration of found family and how teams and clubs can help young people establish a sense of belonging and purpose. I've always said this story is about learning to be okay with the fact that you don't have to have all the answers, and it's far more important to realize who you want to be by your side as you do figure those things out. This story tells us that it's okay not to be perfect, it's okay to have questions, it's okay not to know everything about yourself, because there will always be more to discover as you progress. Sebastian is learning how to embrace what he's been given and how to find stability and comfort from the pieces of his life as they are and not as they should be in someone else's eyes. This story has one of my favorite romances. It's incredibly sweet and funny, complete with grand gestures and iconic tropes, and I've said it before, but I definitely recommend it. After that, I read my e-arc of The List of Things That Will Not Change by Rebecca Stead. This came out on April 7th. It's a middle grade contemporary story about B, whose life has completely changed since her parents' divorce. And to help her cope, they've encouraged her to make a list of things that will not change as she adjusts to navigating between these two different places. Now her dad is getting ready to marry his longtime boyfriend, Jesse, and as the wedding day approaches, B is learning that making a new family brings a lot of questions and surprises. Content warnings for exploration of anxiety and possible depression depression, references to disownment of a queer child, and some mild homophobia from supporting characters. Rebecca Stead's middle grade stories are incredible, and this one is no different. It's warm and wondrous and emotional, and I think it has a great message about how we learn to be ourselves. Because of the divorce and also traumatic family history, B is going to therapy, which I appreciate seeing normalized on the page, and she's learning how to manage her anxiety over things that are out of her control and things that don't make sense to her yet. She's learning that it's not easy to create a blended family and that sometimes our actions are a mask for what we're feeling because sometimes there's a disparity between how we live and what we think. 
It's really great to see those emotional nuances being explored for younger audiences and what almost reads as a charming epistolary novel without actually being one, and it just made me feel so nostalgic for childhood and all its messiness. Growing up is hardly ever simple or straightforward, and Rebecca Studd really captures that in this story about learning how to love, learning how to make room for what matters, and learning how to forgive yourself when it matters the most. I gave this one four and a half stars. After that, my lovely patrons voted for me to read Darius the Great is Not Okay by Adib Karam. This is one of my new favorite books. I've talked about it everywhere on the internet, and I did make a Five Reasons to Read video talking about it, which will be down below, so you should definitely check that out. And another big thank you to my patrons for voting on this book as my April pick. Then the kind folks from HMH Books sent me an e-arc of Maya and the Rising Dark by Reina Barron. This just came out on May 5th. It's an own voices middle grade fantasy adventure, very much in the same vein as the Rick Ryordan Presents books without actually being one. It's inspired by Orishan mythology, and it's about Maya, who discovers that her dad is the gatekeeper between our world and the dark. When her father is taken by an agent of the dark, Maya will have to unlock her own powers and fight off monsters who are hellbent on destroying her life and dragging the entire world into darkness. I really enjoy reading from Raina Barron's imagination. You may recognize her name from her YA debut last year, Kingdom of Souls, which I really enjoyed, and to see how she's taken a similar inspiration and tailored it for a middle grade audience was really great. Something that really stood out to me about this story was that it takes the chosen one trope and completely reverses it in some ways, because Maya is actually not the only person who has magic. I'm not going to say too much, but she's actually deeply embedded in this community that is entirely made up of magic. She just doesn't know it. And that really spoke to me because it seems like a classic hallmark of being the chosen one is living in isolation and not being able to tell people about your deep dark secret because only you and you alone are built to contend with this force. So for Maya to be surrounded by strong people who understand what she's going through and who can support her and mentor her through discovering her magic and this whole other world is kind of a game changer. She has a whole army of people on her side who fundamentally understand who she is. They're not there to be a hindrance to her and they don't expect her to hide those parts of herself, which you really never get to see in these kinds of stories. And I also love that this story shows how actions and magic have consequences and that just having magic in your possession doesn't automatically make you a hero, especially if your heroism endangers or threatens other folks. This was a really fascinating start to a series I would very much like to continue. I did feel like the alternate dimensions and the main villain could have been fleshed out a little bit more, but overall I enjoyed it and I gave it four stars. After that, I picked up my arc of You Should See Me in a Crown by Leah Johnson. This comes out on June 2nd. It's an amazing own voices queer contemporary story about Liz Lighty, who has always felt too different, too poor, too black, too queer to belong in her small, rich, prom-obsessed town. And she's putting all her energy into getting into college so she can finally escape at long last. But when the scholarship she's depending on falls through, Liz feels like she's completely tapped out. That is, until she remembers that her school offers a scholarship to its prom king and queen, and if she can just suck up her pride and start a campaign, this could be her chance. And she might also start falling for a fellow queen in the running, which may or may not be super, super cute. Content warnings for an attempted hate crime, mild homophobia and bullying, some descriptions of chronic illness, specifically sickle cell disease, and some exploration of grief in relation to parental loss. This is the empowering queer prom romantic comedy we deserve and have been wanting for so many years, and if it doesn't become a super rad indie film in the same vein as Love, Simon, that's a crime and that's homophobia. I don't make the rules. This story is chock full of delightful prom court shenanigans. There's bake sales and powder puff games and pep rallies and power plays on social media, and it's all fantastic. So on one hand, it's lighthearted and fun and has an amazing romance, and on the other hand, it's still able to address the very real issue of being a lower class queer black girl trying to navigate a rig system that was very much not made with her in mind in the first place. As Liz is trying to get closer and closer to the crown, she is realizing that blindly conforming to what's expected of a typical prom queen will always be a losing game, and that winning according to her own rules on her own terms is a far sweeter prospect. It's very much a story about Liz finding her confidence, seeing how much love she has in her life, and realizing who is really going to hold it down for her 100%. 
It's such an affirming and joyous stories in ways I can't even explain, plus it has killer band geek references, an amazing second chance platonic friendship, and one of the most adorable FF romances in existence. I need everyone to read this book come June, and I had no choice but to give it five stars. Then I read my e-arc of The Boy in the Red Dress by Kristen Lambert. This was kindly sent to me by the author herself. It comes out on May 12th, and it's an own voices queer YA historical murder mystery set against the backdrop of a queer-friendly speakeasy in New Orleans. Our bisexual heroine Millie is running the show at her aunt's speakeasy on New Year's Eve 1929 when a young socialite comes asking pointed questions about the star of the show, a drag performer named Marion who wears an iconic red dress. This same socialite winds up dead after the show is over and the police are convinced without evidence that Marion is the culprit, which leaves Millie to do some investigating of her own to see if she can solve the case. I mean, when you have such a headstrong bisexual amateur sleuth at the helm of a story like this, how can you not enjoy it? I think mysteries are some of the hardest stories to pull off, and this was a very satisfying mystery to me because it continuously obfuscates the easy assumptions and really deepens your understanding of both the victim and the accused with each new development. The story challenges common assumptions of who is inherently guilty and who is inherently innocent, especially in relation to those who are marginalized and those who have privilege, and it's really interesting to see that level of nuance. It's very easy for the cops to pin this murder on Marion because he's a drag performer, they don't understand him, he has some kind of vague connection to the victim, and that's enough to be considered incriminating evidence. But that's where Millie comes in to defend those who are defenseless, to fight for the people who have been silenced, and to show us that justice is not only reserved for those who can afford it. I was so invested in the story, not only because it has great characters and great banter and this undeniable and then she walked through my door kind of noir energy, but because it was so deliciously twisty and full of sleuthy hijinks that you just can't get anywhere else. I cannot recommend this book enough and you will definitely be hearing more about it from me in the future. I gave this one four and a half stars. Then from my library, I listened to the audiobook of The Girl in the Tower by Catherine Arden, read by Kathleen Gatti. This is the sequel to The Bear and the Nightingale about Vasya, who has been orphaned and cast out of her village as a witch, with her only options being to join a convent or allow her sister to marry her off to a Moscovite prince. But instead, she decides to go adventuring and disguise herself as a boy, which is how she uncovers some bandits who are terrorizing the countryside and stealing young girls from their homes. Vasya becomes entangled in the efforts to track down these bandits when she realizes the kingdom is under threat from destructive magical forces. Content warnings for abduction, attempted physical and sexual assault, sexual assault, specifically forced kissing, public outing and shaming, some use of sexual slurs, some graphic violence, and graphic descriptions of childbirth and complications. It was a little hard for me to get into this story just because I think Vasya is the most interesting character and the only POV I want to read from, and especially in the beginning, the focus is more on supporting characters. And to me, when Vasya and Morosko are interacting together is when the story just sings, and it takes a while to actually get to that. But Vasya continues to be such a fascinating character to me just because of how fiercely independent she is and how determined she is to live and die on her own terms and not anyone else's. I'm also a big fan of characters whose magic almost stems from sheer force of will, characters who can just manifest things into being because of how strongly they believe in themselves, which is definitely the kind of magic Vasya has, and I really love those moments. I do want to say, as a queer non-cis person, it was hard sometimes to swallow the general ignorance in regards to what it takes to pass as a man, and it was also quite hard for me to read the parts where Vasya is publicly outed because thinking of that from a queer perspective is just horrific. So my fellow queer readers out there definitely take that into account, but overall I enjoyed this and I look forward to completing the series hopefully sometime this year. I gave this one four stars. Then Tortine kindly sent me an early copy of The Extraordinaries by TJ Clune. This comes out on July 14th. It's an own voices queer YA SFF story about a world where superpowered individuals exist and are known as extraordinaries. Our main character Nick is gay and has ADHD and is not an extraordinary, but he has an extraordinarily large readership since he has the longest running most popular fan fiction in the Extraordinaries fandom. Nick's favorite hero and ultimate crush Shadowstar is the star of all his stories and after a chance encounter with Shadowstar, Nick is convinced that he has to become an Extraordinary himself, even though he and the entire internet have no idea how that works. Content warnings for exploration of parental loss, some unadvised changes to prescription drugs, some descriptions of graphic injury and violence, and descriptions of panic attacks. 
If you've read In Other Lands by Sarah Reese Brennan, I have to tell you that Nick has big Elliot energy. He's oblivious and opinionated, talks a mile a minute, is always one poorly timed comment away from getting his ass kicked, and I love him so much. This book is fucking hilarious. I have not laughed this much since the last time I read one of TJ Klune's books. I'm not someone who's really into traditional superhero type stories, mostly because it's very hard to pull those off without making it feel cheesy, but TJ Klune leans into the cheesiness and the campiness of superheroes, which is great. And he makes it super easy on the reader because there's really only two main superheroes who appear in the story, so you don't have to memorize all these names or powers or backstories. And there's also a few excerpts of Nick's fanfiction in there as well, which had me in stitches because it has to be super hard for a professional author to get into the mindset of this novice high school writer who overuses adverbs and describes people's muscles way too much and has awful dialogue tags. But TJ Klune really goes there and even includes tags and reader comments, which was a really nice touch. So the story is very funny and enjoyable to read because the comedic timing is perfect. But it's also deeply emotional because Nick's mother has recently passed away and his father is a cop, which is a dangerous line of work, and Nick wants to become an extraordinary not only for selfish reasons, but because he has this deep-seated need to protect. He wants to protect the family he has left, he wants to protect his friends, and on some level he's subconsciously responding to this internalized message that he is broken or less because of his disorder, even though that's not true and it's not his fault. And there's a really nuanced discussion about Nick taking responsibility for his actions and his words, because even though the compulsion is not his fault, his actions still have consequences. This story just took me on such a journey because it makes you think you have it all figured out when you don't, and it really plays with your perceptions of good and evil, even in the sense that Nick is our hero, so to speak, but he undoubtedly makes really bad choices that endanger himself and his friends. All I can say is once again, TJ Klune has blown me away and I gave Gave this one four and a half stars. And finally, I finished off the month with my e-arc of Running by Natalia Sylvester. This was also sent to me by HMH Books. It was recently pushed back to July 14th, I believe. It's an Own Voices Latinx YA contemporary story about a Cuban-American girl named Mariana whose father has always been in politics and has recently announced his campaign to become President of the United States. Over the years, he's always had Mariana's support and kept her in the public eye, but this campaign is bringing a whole new level of scrutiny to her and her family, and she's realizing that she's never really looked into which issues her father supports. So the question becomes, how can she challenge and possibly confront her father's policies when nothing in her life is private? And how can she discover her own voice when she realizes that her dad may not be the hero she thought he was? Content warnings for mild bullying, invasions of privacy, and some derogatory comments. This story really speaks to what the landscape of politics looks like in our current times, especially with social media, clickbait journalism, and even meme culture. What it means to be in politics, even tangentially, is almost changing on a day-to-day -day basis. I really felt for Mariana, whose classmates feel entitled to comment on her father as a public figure, even when they don't fully understand politics themselves. And as someone who's heard many a teenager's half-baked political opinions, that really checks out. And it can be hard to read this story at times, especially as Mariana is realizing that she lacks agency and a voice, and that she's allowed herself to be used as a prop all these years to give her dad this image of being a family man while never taking the time to consider how she really feels. And to me, it represents this crucial break in the process of coming of age where you're realizing that what you've been taught is separate from the person you really are, and that you owe it to yourself to find out exactly who that is. Mariana is very much disrupting her family's expectations, the entire political cycle, and realizing that she has this platform and this power to really make a difference. To me, this story is about being brave enough to claim your own destiny and to speak out against injustice, even when it comes at great personal cost. I think this is an incredibly moving and empowering story that so many young people need right now, and for that I gave it four and a half stars. So those are all the books I read in the month of April. As always, if you've read any of them yourself, or if you would like to read them in the future, I would love to know what you think in the comments below so we can discuss. But that's everything I have for this wrap-up today. Thank you so much for watching this video. I really hope that you enjoyed it, and I'll catch you on the flip side of the page. Bye!